Uh, if everyone is ready, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Michael A. Creeden Annual Lecture on Aging. This is our 12th uh, annual lecture, and we're really pleased to see all of you here. It's always especially a delight to have um, the lecture on this campus. As many of you know, we trade it back and forth, and so uh, if you want to, you can wave hello. The back screen shows the uh, group in Mesa, so they are uh, watching the lecture as, as it goes on here. Um, as I said a minute ago, there is a sign-in sheet for those of you who are coming in now. Um, there is a sign-in sheet somewhere along the road, so if you would make sure you're signing that, um, signing in on that, and then also make sure you have an evaluation form and you can fill that out uh, as we finish the lecture. Um, delighted to welcome three friends uh, from St. Louis University. Uh, in your uh, little brochure, there is a bio of each of our speakers. Dr. Milta Little is a, a geriatrician at St. Louis University. Um, she has been really uh, instrumental in some of our uh, work with the new grant uh, that we are a partner of St. Louis University with on a geriatric workforce um, enhancement program. So we're delighted to have her and also to other colleagues who are actually from uh, Perryville, Missouri. And um, Janice Lundy and Debbie Hayden are our colleagues from, from uh, Perryville. Uh, who have been working closely with St. Louis University as well on the topic of cognitive stimulation therapy. From a personal note, um, how many of you have had someone in your family or known someone close who have had dementia? Okay, well, that explains a lot of your presence here. Dementia is something that certainly is um, increasing and facing all of us. Um, and if you've had that experience, uh, something that would make life a little better is, is a real uh, potential positive thing in our lives. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Little. Um, Janice and Debbie will be adding to the lecture uh, as uh, the hour goes on. So uh, enjoy the lecture. Stimulation therapy or CST is the ability to take a group of people, put them in a single environment a couple of times a week, and each time take them from a beginning of memories and move them forward into a more difficult type of memory, finally reaching things that are to do with memories that are happening today. It's a group activity that engages older adults, even those with memory loss and fairly profound memory loss, to be able to socialize with each other, have normal conversation, and kind of reach back into their long-held memories and fast forward them into today's world. This provides them a way to interact with one another. It provides them a way to have meaningful activity. And it actually has been shown to improve their quality of life and in some instances, even their, their cognitive status and their behaviors improve through the, the CST. So often in a long-term care setting, elders relate to the staff primarily. And so one of the benefits of cognitive stimulation therapy is that they begin to relate to one another, get to know their personalities, something about their histories. So that is a, a huge benefit of the program. And in, in learning about other people, we naturally do have fun. There's a lot of humor. There's some spontaneous singing that occurs, laughter, even people teasing each other about memory. What about the style of costumes, you know, when you were younger compared to now? They, we didn't have those horrible, hideous looking things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the scary. Oh yeah. Oh, we, we just dressed up, mainly I dressed up as a gift. You know, mm -hmm. so we dressed up in overalls and. <laughs> yeah, whatever we had in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, so yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we made our own costumes maybe. Right. We didn't buy a bought one. You know. no. Right. Whatever you had at home, you put together. Mm -hmm. Candy and made up our faces. Were, were mm -hmm. That was a mess. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> All right. So that's just a little taste of cognitive stimulation therapy. And I would like to, so I got to flip back over here um, to our slides. 
And uh, I would just like to, first of all, say thank you for letting me come and speak with you all on this topic and how excited that we are to have this large group of people here. And hello back in, in Mesa also to be with us to talk about this today. So I have to acknowledge the people who have really put the work in. So I work at St. Louis University. I have experience with CST with some of my patients, but I am not the one that put the program together nor keep it running in any capacity. So I would love to acknowledge, first of all, my colleagues who came from Perry County and, and that they, they did so much work down in at their hospital, even before we even knew it was going on. They, they ran with it and then they've been able to come back and help us with our programming again. Uh, and then certainly some other colleagues of mine of, at St. Louis University who have been instrumental in this. So throughout the next hour or so, we will be just kind of giving you an introduction into cognitive stimulation therapy, what it is, how we can use it to support our patients and our clients that live in the community and live in long-term care settings, and then kind of how do we start to incorporate this? So hopefully you'll be able to have some take-homes in terms of, if I want to do this, what do I need to do to get this started in, in my facility or in my practice? So that's what we hope to do. So this is a picture of the manuals that are available for our CS team. And I want to tell you the first time I ever heard about CST, now I don't remember how long ago it was, I guess maybe three years ago now. And uh, Dr. Morley, who's my boss, Dr. John Morley, he, he travels all over the world. And, and he came back from London so excited about this thing that we are now going to do. And he always comes back from somewhere saying, there's this thing we're all going to do. So we're just like, oh, okay, why not? And so then he says, no, 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 we're really going to do this. And he brings uh, Dr. Martin Oral, who is one of the founders of CST. And he comes and he speaks to us and he's giving the lecture. And of course, so I raise my hand and I ask a question about cognitive behavioral therapy. And he looks at me like, this is not cognitive behavioral therapy. So there's a very distinct difference. So when we talk about some of the things that, are, that sound similar, CBT is something completely different. So that's a, a, a different type of therapy, very specific way of treating depression and other things in, in when you're a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a counselor, social work counselor. Uh, whereas this is something totally different. This is something specifically designed with people who have cognitive impairment in mind. And it's a social thing. It's a fun thing. And it's designed for a very different purpose, although sometimes the outcomes may look similar to some of the other therapies that you might hear about. So as I said, this was created by a team of researchers in, in the UK. And what they did first was they did a literature review and they said, okay, let's look at all the literature that that shows us what non-pharmacologic management is beneficial and helpful for people with cognitive impairment. And they looked at all that, pulled it all together and said, okay, what pieces seem to be the most important and most impactful? And let's put that together and create this program. So that's, that's where it created. And uh, they, their initial pilot study just basically said, does it work? Can we do it? And then they modified it a little bit. And then they had a uh, multi-center randomized control trial of 23 different centers where they were able to find that it improved quality of life and it actually improved many mental status exam scores as well for people with cognitive impairment. And so they said, well, this is exciting. And they started to talk about it and to publish on it. And people, it is actually is now in multiple different countries around the world where people have started to do this. And when we talk about the improvement in cognition, the use of CST improves cognition at at least the same rate as any medication that we have now available to treat dementia. It also comes with no physical side effects. So when we talk about efficacy, risk versus benefit, this far outweighs the risk. Whereas with a lot of medications that we have to treat dementia, unfortunately, the risks often in many cases, and in, in may, maybe most cases, outweigh the benefit that we see. So that, that is kind of how it came about. Um, they have some wonderful quotes from their website in terms of what they started to see when people started to participate, why they thought this was so important. So these are people with dementia. I said, I noticed people becoming more fluent. And you could see people trying to express themselves more. And that was something that objectively they were able to see 
is that language acquisition and fluency improved with CST. And the people themselves, the participants themselves started to notice that subjectively as well. We just enjoyed ourselves. There's an awful lot of laughter. So you're taking people who are often in, uh, so these were in care homes. So it, you know, in the UK, care homes may look a little bit different than ours. They probably look more like assisted livings do here. And these are people that often we see depression, isolation. And these, they said, we got together, we had a whole lot of laughter. And it helped us all know we were in the same boat. Again, addressing that isolation, that we're in this together, we have similar things that are happening to us, and how can we address this together? So uh, this, the key features of CST are, are as follows, and, and my colleagues who are doing this on a almost day-by-day -day basis, they've been doing it for two years now, can give you more details on exactly what this looks like. But a, a CST program is basically four core uh, sessions. So you have or, sorry, 14, 14 core sessions. So you have the 14 sessions, and it's usually run twice a week. Uh, they uh, typically run about 45 minutes to an hour. The original CST did not include exercise. This was just the CST sessions themselves. And now I'm going to pause for a second. I, I, we will show you this later, but we have a bunch of material on our aging website, aging.slu.edu. Many things on CST as well as some other things. And so you'll be able to see what a session actually looks like going to those materials. They didn't include exercise at first, but at St. Louis University, we did start to include an exercise component to that to see how that would also address some of the other geriatric syndromes. So if you do exercise, you're going to need to factor in that's going to be longer than an hour, depending on how long your exercise component. So CST itself, about 45 minutes to an hour. Ideally, you want your group to be enough people to stimulate discussion, but you don't want to have so many that people can't interact. So five to eight is probably a pretty good number. And you typically will want to have two facilitators to help. Again, one person kind of helps to drive the discussion at one point while the other one watches and see what's going on, and then back and forth between kind of the, the facilitators doing their thing. Uh, and and, uh, and another thing about it is that it's, it's, it's not so prescriptive that every group runs exactly the same way. So there's a choice of activities where you could pick up the manual and go, but it's individualized to the group. And you want to consider too, so if you, if you are in a facility and you have people at various stages of dementia and you're gonna create multiple groups, you want to try to keep people about the same level together so that those activities are meaningful and appropriate to the group as a whole. And you don't leave, some, maybe somebody is not gonna be left out of what is going on. Uh, and, and gender to some extent, sometimes they're mixed groups, sometimes they, they want to keep it as, as just one gender. So if you're starting to think, okay, I'm starting to picture some people in my head that might be appropriate for this CST thing, how do I know that the person is right for this or not? CST was designed for people with mild to moderate cognitive impairment. So this is not designed for severe dementia. Although we could do similar things with, from the CST standpoint with people with more advanced dementia to address behaviors, the actual CST program is going to be for those more mild to moderate. So the first criteria that you want to look at is some uh, screen for dementia to, to, to assess. We use the St. Louis University Mental Status Exam. Number one, we, we designed it, so we like to use our own things. But really, the, the, the reason we push it is because it is not copyrighted. Some of the other cognitive screens are copyrighted, so if you use it, you have to pay for it. Ours is free, so you can use it at any point. You don't have to get our permission. It's available. If you Google slums, it's the second thing that comes up. The first is images of slums around the United States, and the next one is us. So we are number two. Um, so you can find it anywhere and, and have access to it. Uh, so it has to have a slums greater than 10. So they have to be able to, to have some cognitive reserve to then be able to have a meaningful conversation. And couldn't you engage them in some way? And it doesn't have to be that they can talk politics and know exactly what's going on, but they have to be able to engage someone. 
Now, the next two are address some of the, just the ability for them again to participate. So they can they hear well enough in a group setting to be able to know what's going on and participate. Now, and, and you two may be able to speak to this a little bit more. I've got to hear some fantastic stories on our travel over here of some of the, the things that their participants say and do. And, and I know that they have at least one participant who's, who's pretty hard of hearing and they still manage to make it work. So you have to take those that with a grain of salt. Same with the vision of can, can we modify some of this to make it appropriate for people with some, some sensory uh, impairment. And then do you have somebody who is, is just going to sit down for five minutes and has to get up and walk away and, and wander off? Is that person probably not going to be appropriate for the type of group where you have to sit still for 45 minutes and remain engaged? So those are kind of, hopefully now you've started to think, all right, I've got some people in mind that might be appropriate for this thing called CST. Now let's, let's kind of start thinking about the structure itself of how are we going to run this thing. So the first thing you want to do is, and, and this is the same, you want to make sure that this happens every session. So you want to welcome people. Welcome each person that comes in the room. And they have a name tag, and they are identified by who they are. And, and, and it's the same thing every time. And everybody comes up with the group name. So you, have to, you identify the individual, and then you identify the group. Another thing is, is orientation. So that's another piece that's important is to identify this is the day today, this is the date, and this is, this is our group. And then there's a, usually a warm-up of some kind during the introduction. And then there's a song. They're, they have the theme song. So there's the, the introduction, then the group chooses their song, and they can sing. The, usually they'll sing along. You, you heard in the video, they'll say people just burst into song. So they, they sing the song, or uh, sometimes they'll just listen along. And then you talk about some of the current affairs, some of the things that are going on, what is going on with the presidential race, with, and all, some of the other things that might be going on here in Kirksville. Did you hear about what happened down at the lake? I, you know, so things, things like that that you might want to just kind of talk about current affairs. Then there's the activity. And each session has the different activity that is chosen. And that activity is, is created for a very specific reason. It addresses specific parts of cognition. And, and then, and, but it's, it's done in a fun way. Then after that, there's, there's homework quote unquote, homework for the people. So there's a packet that gets, gets home, just gets sent home. So oftentimes it's, it's an article or something of that nature where they can, the article was discussed at group. They get to take it home and maybe have an opportunity to discuss that with the family member at home. And then the closure. So we always want to, as with any good group, you have to have a good introduction and a good closing statement. So that's how the, the general structure of that works. There's something that was really important is that there were 18 key principles for CST. And this is what distinguishes it from all of the other kinds of acronyms you might hear, like CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. This is, this is what makes this unique, are these key principles. So the first is this idea of mental stimulation. So you want to make sure that the activities are being done at an appropriate level, that people are being challenged mentally, and that they know that some of the activities might be a little bit difficult. And so you, you don't want to frighten them from it, but you also, you want to, you, we're engaging them. We're, we're trying to get them uh, to do some hard work today. Um, and so you just kind of letting them know we're going to do some mental exercises today. We're, it's going to be fun, but we're, we're going to stretch ourselves a little bit. The second thing is coming up with new ideas. This is important because when people develop dementia, they often will reminisce, which is great, or talk about the past, which is great. We want that. That's part of this, and that's actually part of one of the key principles. Yet, we want to try to stimulate new ideas from the participants and get them, get them starting to think about those things. Um, and then orientation. So making sure that they know what day it is, the time, the, t the season, but doing it in a very sensitive way. So if somebody comes and they're insisting 
that it is January 4th when it is April 1st. You don't want to push that and say, no, it is April 1st. And oh, you know, you don't get in their faces about things like that. So gently and tactfully and just part of the orientation, this is this is what is going what is going on. Um, another important thing is is allowing for opinions, opinions of what's going on. So facts are important. So when you're talking about the current events, what's happening in the world, facts are important. But allowing them to express an opinion. So for example, instead of saying, so who's president right now? Maybe you could say, what is your opinion about politicians? What is your opinion about the United States president? And that gives them an opportunity to start to discuss these things. And maybe they know what's going on in our current presidential race. Maybe they don't. And they're going to talk about something that happened 30 years ago. But that gets them to, to stimulate the discussion and give their opinions. And then reminiscence is, is a critical aid. Reminiscence and the next one, the triggers, using all five senses. So maybe a picture, a smell, something that feels, you can, so you can bring in materials. So sometimes, you know, if you're talking about clothing and maybe the participants used to make their clothes, so there may be fabric there, they could feel that kind of thing. Um, anything that, that helps to stimulate memory, reminiscence, and, and again, driving, getting them challenged. I'm going to show another quick video here. We talk about consistency, another piece of the video. I got to get to it. Okay, I keep trying to yeah. Okay, do we remember what today's day of the week is? The 26th. Thursday. Of June. Mm -hmm. Thursday. Yep, Thursday, June 26th. And what is the year? 2014. Yep. And who remembers our group name? New Troopers. Yep. And what is our group song? You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. Sister Sue, my only sunshine. You make me happy when the skies are gray. You'll never know how much I love you. Just a little mental break for everybody here, but also, you know, that. That idea of the consistency. So they do the same thing. They do the date, they do the orientation, they do their group name, they sing their song. And there's that consistency and continuity and kind of cohesiveness of the sessions and the group. Now this next one, the implicit rather than explicit learning. For those of us in the room who are in higher education, you know that when we educate, we have to explicitly tell people a lot of times, you are learning about X. This is what you are learning. In this, we want it to be more implicit, where we're not telling them, we're going to learn about blah, blah, blah today, and I'm teaching you these facts. No, this is, we're going to be learning, but it's going to be more subtle and kind of the undertones of the session. Um, because it's, it's really going to be, and I'll show you some of the other critical features, more fun and engaging than anything else. Um, language, so being naming, and there are some other pieces that I was going to show about, you know, remembering and recalling names of actresses and, and objects and things of that nature. And for, in the interest of time, I won't show that one. But again, this, this video is in its entirety, it's 15 minutes long, is on our aging website. Uh, executive functioning, so wanting to be able to discuss different things, to kind of bringing the mind from here connecting the dots over here. So for example, how is something similar and different to something else? And then of course, we, off, we always have to think about person-centeredness and respect and making sure that it's about them, not us as facilitators, and that we're respecting that people come from different places, they have different cultures, they have different opinions, and that we want to be very mindful that sometimes we may expose difficult things in the process 
of, of doing this stimulation therapy. Some the last principles are the principles of involvement and inclusion, um, and, and among others. So that idea is make all the participants around the table are getting involved, and that's the key piece of the facilitator is to make sure that their people are all getting involved. And, and if you notice that somebody is standing back and not participating, you have to start to think, hmm, why? What's going on? Is it because the person is not feeling well? Is there depression? Is there something else we can identify that maybe needs to be passed along to uh, someone else on the, on the healthcare team? Uh, or is it just a matter of this person is, is shy, is an introvert? Uh, I often have a lot of people, when I tell them they need to do things like this, they are like, I've never been a social person. And they just look at me and they turn up their noses and they're like, mm, no, I've never been. But it doesn't mean that they don't benefit from this group. So those of you in this room who are introverts, you know that 45 minutes with a group of people is going to zap your energy. And so we have to be mindful of that as well. It's important. Even introverts need socialization. But it's important to be mindful that those people also need to have the break time afterwards and that to, to be able to get them included in a way that is respectful to their need to maybe step away at times. And then, of course, offering that choice. We talked about that. It's not a prescription that every group looks the same. Every group is going to be different in some sort. Fun, fun, fun is the number one. You saw those ladies just interacting and having fun and talking about different things. Maximizing potential really important that you want people to work at their highest level. So if you know that people can do more, we want to try to push them there to be able to do more. So maximizing what the capabilities are and then those relationships. So this is our CST experience at St. Louis University. We had uh, two projects running the rural hospital based CST that ran without exercise. And then we have the urban, suburban, residential, and community-based CST groups that did with and without exercise. So the first thing that happened is all these assessments were done. <laughs> Excuse me. So we did an assessment cognition, quality of life, depression scale, the timed up and go for the exercise component. We needed to find out their functional status. The short blessed, which is another cognitive test. Trail making A and B is a cognitive test and then the mobility and daily activity assessment. And then amongst other things as well, uh, just a bunch of assessment to kind of look how, what impact did CST have on these participants. So this is the, the, the change scores over time. And you can see that over a seven week time period that there was significant improvement on the St. Louis University mental status exam as well as depression scores and quality of life. So we were able to, to show that. And the project one, remember, was the one without exercise. So we wouldn't expect to see strength or function chimed up and go. We wouldn't expect to see that improve necessarily. But the, the cognitive and uh, psychosocial issues, we would hope to see improved, and we did. Now, when, as opposed to the data that came out of the UK, when they extended the, the lookout and they did some maintenance CST, they found that there was a continued benefit at six to 12 months. Now this was just looking at when they've done their 14 sessions, do they have the continued benefit? And they found that there wasn't a, a significant difference after six to 12 months. And so that tells us that we need to do some maintenance CST to really try to get this to, to uh, continue to see a change. Uh, let's get that one. So, Yoga was added. So one of our one of our um, CST facilitators at St. Louis University is is a big yoga person, and she does a lot of yoga all the time. She's amazing. She would hate me if I told you how old she is, but she looks about 15 years younger than she is, and she attributes this to yoga. So she said that was really important for her to include the yoga into this. So there was. Um, uh, the compared to a yoga group versus a non-yoga group. And they were actually able to find that there was improvement in their quality of life, improvement in their timed up and go. And then their, uh, again, 
we saw improvements in the slums and the depression scales as well, particularly in the, the groups with, with CST. So the time up and go, you want that number to go to go down. So the yoga group, that number went, went down. So lower your timed up and go, the better, because it's in, in seconds. So we have, like I said, we have train the trainer toolkits. We have one of two centers in the United States that currently train people on how to do CST that have the official designation from the UK are here in this room, They're here in Missouri. So we are very fortunate to have that. Uh, but we have a bunch of toolkits that are available to you. Again, I'm fortunate to work at a place where we make our stuff available for you to use. So please use it. So aging.slu.edu. If you have questions, I'm going to leave this here for a second. Um, if you have questions, please uh, email aging at slu.edu, and the person who answers that will be able to get you to the right person. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over, and thank you so much for your attention. Uh, geriatrics and so I actually learned about uh, CST at a uh, the summer sym symposium a few years ago at St. Louis University and uh, wrote a grant we actually have a, a, a tax in the county I come from uh, in Perry County for a senior tax so it's it's for any anything uh, for transportation nutrition or quality of life so our county actually, the mental health or the uh, senior tax actually funds part of our program. So, um, so I'm just going to recap. Uh, Dr. Little has gone through the basic structure and the key principles, but just sort of show you how you would actually do this. Debbie and I have uh, run about 500 of these sessions now. Uh, in, uh, so far in a two year period and about 11 every week. So, um, so what it really looks like is you've got, you're going to have two, two facilitators. Um, and Debbie, we have chosen, uh, I have a social work background and she's an occupational therapist. We feel that is a really good fit because this is really a psychosocial therapy. Um, so I'm always looking more at sort of the, uh, the emotional, uh, piece of it and Debbie more the functioning and neurological so it really it, it's a good combination so um, but how a session really uh, I'm just going to kind of walk you through one so the first thing that you would do you are always going to uh, have like a whiteboard and you noticed in the video she had it sort of on the table there and wrote on it but what we would do is actually have the, uh, the group name, which you decide at the very first session, which you think might be really difficult to come up with, but it's really not. You sort of just throw out to them, you know, we, we want to um, uh, decide on a name for our group. One important thing is Debbie and I are very much seen as part of the group. We are not seen as teachers or, I mean, they clearly know that we are the facilitators and the leaders, but they see us as part of the group and, and we give our opinions. We have a little a video too. And one of the guys, George, he always says they give our, their opinions. We give our. This is where the, the subtle orientation comes in because this therapy is really based off of four things. The research was reality orientation patient, which they knew through uh, the literature review was really effective in, um, in that cognition piece and helping with their memory. But the, the problem was it was done in a they kind of degrade. group name, the group song, the day of the week, the year, the season, and the weather. 
So they always have a reference, a visual reference to that. So we subtly, so what we do is we get together, we start out in a circle in, in and this is how we do it. It's very individualized, whatever works for, you know, their people are going to be functioning at a different level. So, but we always have them start out in a circle. We have chairs in a circle and, um, um, and we have the, uh, that information on the board. So we'll just have a general conversation about, so for instance, today is April 1st. So we will, um, uh, we will, um, I will not directly ask them the day of the week, but sometimes we'll just generally, we might even say it. Sometimes we'll say, well, today is the, you know, the first day of April. Is this, is this usual weather? It's really cold here in Kirksville for, is this usually how it is in April? So sort of subtly instead of asking them that question. So in the year, and then we'll say in the year, it's uh, 2016. And I generally said, wow, 2016. That is, isn't that, you know, does it seem like that much time has gone by? And so we'll have a, well, you know, just subtly like that. Um, so then what do we, um, oh, and then we toss the ball. So we have a ball and the, the idea behind that is you're doing two things. So you're tossing the ball back and forth. So they have to say the person's name you know, and then throw the ball to another person. So they have to remember kind of who's had the ball. And then after we've done that once or twice, then we'll kind of introduce something like, say, uh, it's springtime now. So I might say, what's your, this time when you get the ball, what, um, what's your favorite thing about spring? And then they will have to have, it's kind of connecting two things, two pieces of information. and then um, what their favorite thing about spring is. So that's sort of the idea is to, um, to subtly do that. And then we have a, we always have a current event. And usually we still do that in the, in the, in the circle and Debbie, that's her job. She always comes up with the, <laughs> with the article for the day. Sometimes it'll be something current that's going on in the community. But a lot of times we will have, um, and maybe just a subject like, um, well, we just had Easter. So we actually had an article on different areas in the, uh, we're one of the few places that actually refrigerate eggs. <laughs> so we had an article that talked about that and then just sort of the ideas to bring them those new ideas, thoughts and associations. So you're always trying to remember that during, throughout the therapy. So we started to talk about, did you, um, uh, did, did they refrigerate eggs? Do they remember, you know, from the past? You want to take them from the past and bring them forward. So, um, so we'll we'll have our news article, and then we um, move to the table where we always have. There's a uh, we have an activity then, and um, yeah. Oh, and we sing our song. Yeah. So we have singing. You are my sunshine. Oh, what about? times about six times a week yeah we oh, sing yeah yeah and there's a little bit of a negative yeah. connotation to you are my That's sunshine the end, yeah. yeah you are yeah there's yeah yeah there's a verse in there that if you don't love me and you lead me to love another you will regret it someday we've had conversations just about the song so I want to talk just briefly again about the manual. So if you are going to start this, okay, is there are three manuals. The middle manual there, you'll see the blue one. That is the making a difference. That is the original manual that was developed with 14 sessions. So there are 14 sessions in that manual. So they're all, the whole structure is laid out there for you and 14 different themed activities. So it start, it is important that you do them somewhat in order because they're, they're laid out as sort of in uh, difficulty. Um, so you kind of build, one session builds on the other. So we do mix them up a little bit. But the main thing about the manuals is remember, these are not prescriptive. I mean, they, they were designed, the reason Dr. Spector and her group in London designed these manuals because they want them to, these, these to be used. You know, they wanted to make it easy. So yes, for you to just pick up the book and, and go with it. If you had to develop this program on your own, so they've developed it. Second manual, the red manual, the making a difference too, that is actually 24 more sessions. So what they, that's the maintenance manual. So they first did the research based off of the first manual, then they developed 24 more sessions. Um, it, actually, the, I love this manual because it comes with a DVD. 
so I, and the DVD has every session um, with them doing the session. So, I mean, you can actually visually watch them. When Debbie and I started, we didn't go to London until for training until we were six to nine months into this. Um, so we, we started it before we, uh, we went there, but I watched, so why I'm telling you this is for a reason. So I watched before I did each session for a long time, I watched that video again, because there, those subtleties, those key principles are really key to this therapy. You can do this and it can be a, you can get, those those things you really have to follow those principles so um that being said the third manual is the is the it, this manual just came out this year the green manual and this was designed specifically for caregivers to be able to provide that therapy at home so we have trained all of our families uh, especially our two year out to year out families and doing this therapy at home and we encourage them to do two to three sessions a week at home along with what we, what we're doing in the group the research on the uh the caregiver led was not in, in cognition and uh, improved quality of life and but not so much in the in the cat in cognition but what would they did find was that it was very beneficial also to that caregiver you know, the spouse and child, it gave them that time uh, away from that caregiving duties to sit and really have a quality time with, with their loved one. It, it increased. So interesting, their depression, uh, the caregiver depression decreased along uh, with their health and well-being. So another reason to, yeah. So we do do some individual sessions too. We go out into the community, homebound people who really are not functioning well enough to be able to come in for the therapy. So it can be it can be done professionally led too. There's not a lot of research on on that yet on the you know comparing it, but I have done it and I've had similar results as the as the group session. So. So basically, where to begin? I mean, pacing you. If you were going to start one of these programs, which is our goal here, to impassion you, to uh, to start a CST program. So all you need to begin with really is one group. You all in your minds are thinking about. You just need six to eight people with mild to moderate dementia um, to you know and start out just with one group. There's not an extensive a lot of training that really is required for this. Anybody can really do this therapy. Um, and Debbie's going to talk a little bit about, we do, you, we are a um, So we, we bill for our, our first 14 sessions. So, um, but really anybody can do it. If you're an activities director in a, in a, in a nursing care facility, just in the community, a church member, anybody can learn to do this. So nurses, occupational therapists, social workers, speech therapists. So, um, so in just kind of preparing to uh, begin a group, um, you know, what we do is we bring in a lot of our referrals for you. I know that we have a lot of students here. A lot of our referrals, most of our referrals come from our physicians. Our physicians in our community are very aware that we do this therapy when they're doing the slums or their cognitive tests or they see that their patients are having memory problems, they refer them to us. So they actually write an order for cognitive stimulation therapy. They send us their histories. And, and um, so that is where a lot of our uh, referrals are generated from. So we bring them in and we sit down, we talk to the family, the caregivers, we tell them about, and the patient tell them about what the program's all about. And we do our pre, our pre-screenings at that time. So uh, you have to argue that transportation, if you cannot get them there, and these are our community dwelling, I mean, you have to be able to, you know, make sure that they're going to get to the sessions. I actually make them kind of make a commitment to me, sort of a little contract that if they say they're going to start it, yeah, uh, that they have to come to as many of the sessions um, as they can. And they take that very seriously. So they, we have a pretty good luck. I said, I understand you have a, may have a doctor's appointment or something, but yeah, they don't just get to cop out because they're tired. So they, they really, we have a good um, turnover of, of for our session. So um, deciding, deciding the time of the day, we always prefer to do it in the mornings. They're just more cognitively alert in the morning. So we run our sessions at nine and 10 o'clock in the morning. So 
again, and just being really prepared for the session ahead of time. So, um, so critical to me, I just kind of went through and did this slide um, a day ago and thought, what are the really the critical things to the success? Fully understanding and following the key principles, that whole avoiding putting individuals on the spot. This is set up designed to be uh, in a very uh, uh, stress-free uh, environment. So kind of uh, keeping that in mind that you, that, um, keeping the, reducing the, the person's stress level. A effective use of reminiscence. So the idea is, is that they love talking about things from the past. We know that their long-term memory is the most intact, but taking that past and bringing it forward is where this, what really works with this. So um, just keeping that in mind. Uh, concentrating on creating those new ideas, thoughts, and associations. So a lot of the sessions are going to be designed to work on those different elements. Um, for example, we do a session we like to do, it's called our house session. So we have a number of, of different types of homes and then sort of ask them questions like, what house do you, what looks most like the house you might have lived in when you were growing up? You know, and then what house, very opinion based, you're never asking a factual question, but what, what about when you were raising your kids? What kind of house looks like the one? Which one is your favorite? Which one would you want to live in now? And, um, why, and, and then again, like uh, asking them questions about maybe what a house would have cost. How did they pay for a house? You know, did you pay cash? A lot of people in that, that we have, these older generations, they pay cash for a house. Yeah, and how do you think a, a person now, how do you think a young couple now would, would buy a home? And just those types of things. So you get to bringing them from the past and then and, and bringing them forward. So every session sort of is, is designed in that way. So if you were at, some of you were at the lecture we gave this morning. And, uh, I did a little spiel on working memory and, cortisol levels and stress control. But I think just to say a little bit here, when you're, when really Janice and I look at it as, you know, you've got your working memory where people are thinking in words or in pictures and you have the ruminators who so can't move past that one thought that you can send it on that, their OCD function. Really, the way this is set up is, is really good because what you're doing is you're going in there and you're catching their working memory where you can find them, a long-term memory. So they pull it up, they're thinking about their childhood, because they always, always remember their childhood. Come to childhood. But then you don't leave them there. You're in essence walking into something else and turning another light in on their working memory so that they start connecting things. So you're starting with where you can catch them, but that's not where you stay. You start saying, okay, I've got you thinking this thought. And then kids, we can push that very fast. I can say, tell me six things that are you can find in the sky. And you can push that. With these people, you have to almost like scroll through their working memory. So when you were a child, this looks like the house you had when you were a child. How do you think your parents paid for that? How do you, how did you buy your first house? Do you, you know, um, was your first house anything like your parents' house? Do you think homes today cost the same as your house? And you start to, you help them connect one dot to the next, to the next. And you start firing that working memory. Because Excuse me, we can't hear you memory is fundamental to accessing executive function. And then we kind of talked a little bit about cortisol in the first group. Cortisol being um, something that we need to control, and that's why we keep the stress level down and we don't. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, for the sake of time, I hope that gave you a little bit of feel for what this therapy is all about. And, and Debbie's piece of it is really that whole, you know, the uh, how the how the memory really works so again that just gives you a feel that this isn't just a social activity there are a lot of elements to it that it's important that you understand Blow those up. key yeah. principles so maybe was, i think we're at a point for questions so does anybody have any questions or we have a question in mesa so oh yeah someone had a question earlier okay i'm very interested in the involvement of caregivers, because we have a lot of, uh, a large population of folks here in the East Valley who are taking care of family members with dementia. Do you have separate sessions for them or do you help them facilitate those sessions where they bring their caregiver and perhaps uh, run the program uh, with you there? Yeah, well, what 
what we did was, yeah, we actually brought our caregivers in and we did individually without their, without their, uh, uh, in, without their loved one with dementia. And we did, we did a, oh gosh, we've done eight hours worth of training with them. But yes, ideally, yes. Ideally what you would want to do is go into the home and actually help go through, you know, sessions with them until they're comfortable with them. And then in that manual, the green manual, um, it, the caregiver manual, there's a DVD in there. And it actually walks through exactly how to do that. They have like a professional, one of their PhD students actually goes into the home and it shows that, that whole process. And so you, you, I recommend, yes. Anybody else? Is there somebody else out there? Is there somebody? You might want to talk about hooking them up with resources. Which are very, yeah. Are there any other questions? Did, another, did that answer your question or? Yes, it did. I, I am curious too, do you have, do you ever invite caregivers to come to the regular sessions that you do with the, you know, with the dementia patients themselves? Yeah, um, we have not done that because I think it makes our, um, it makes our participants un, uh, kind of uncomfortable, but I'll actually, we ideally what you want to do is if you could have a support group at the same time they're there for the caregivers. We our, our caregivers actually kind of congregate in a, uh, a little lounge area and they have their own little support group going on. So, um, but uh, we don't ever invite them into the group, the group setting. Um, so I, I don't know that you that you couldn't, but we haven't done that. But we also really are when you get, as you know, when you're talking about the caregiver piece, we know when you're you're working with these patients, you're not just working with them, but their families. We are really case managing them. They're we are constantly, they sort of, you know, see us as the expert. They are telling us things that are happening at home and asking for advice. A lot of times we are catching things. Uh, but as clinicians, we are seeing things in sessions. We know when they're not functioning as well. You know, we get in touch with our doctors and um, refer them to physical therapy. You'll see over time, you know, you'll see them, you know, maybe not walking as well. They're balanced. Something's not, something's not right. So we really, um, you know, as clinicians, we really um, work with our medical staff with our patients. So, What is the minimum amount of pre-testing that you've required? In terms of, of the, you, you do a number of pretests on these individuals before you let them into the program. Is the slums the, the minimum requirement in terms of their having to do that? So, when you're, I guess I have two questions. How do you recruit them out of the community? And what's, what's the minimum amount of pretest that you do with them to be able to assess whether or not they can come in? Good question. You know, we, um, uh, most of our referrals uh, come from our physicians. So they've already done some kind of cognitive test in their office. So, um, but um, we also get referrals just from the community, word of mouth that have heard about the program. Um, uh, so uh, we usually, yeah, and, and really the, the the, the screenings that you do, part of it is because we're billing under Medicare for occupational therapy. So those are required in our, and we develop goals and, uh, and things. But if you're just, if you're doing this in a nursing, in a care center, like, or in the community, um, I just feel that it's important that you have something to gauge how they're doing. So at minimal, I would do uh, I mean, some kind of cognitive test like the, like the slums um, and a depression screen, because a lot of times these people may be having depression and that could be part of the reason that they're having problems. So we do a depression screen and then there's a validated quality of life in Alzheimer's disease uh, screening. So we do that with them and their caregivers, the depression screen and the um, quality of life screen. And then in, in the, when the 14 sessions are over, we do that. We, we, pre, we screen them again. And that really just, I mean, we're seeing the progress in the session, but we, but we also, those screens are, yeah. So that's how we kind of gauge how they're doing. But is it required? Not necessarily. Um, Thank you. Need to have, yeah. We do have a question. 
Do you see this therapy being widely taken up and applied in, in um, care settings such as nursing homes or um, assisted living? And what is the level of training required for a facilitator in this setting to um, carry out this, this 14 um, session program? Uh, do you want to talk? Uh, you know, the original study, as I said, was was designed for people uh, in the community or in assisted living type. But uh, we actually, the first places we instituted it was in the nursing home, and we we saw benefit. And the, the the groups that I showed you on the video, those actually were nursing home residents. So it and it um, it doesn't take a whole lot of training just because there's the training is already there so the manuals are very as we said very descriptive and 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 uh, detailed on how to do that um specific length of time i don't know if you know how to train the specific length of time it takes just you know, again, i think part of that training part of it is just practicing yeah, practicing it and book, doing it yeah the yeah the books are excellent uh, first years, I believe, have class now, so they'll need to go. But uh, anyone who wants to come back down and ask questions, I think our team will be here for a few more minutes. So 